your memory about uh, how far we have yet to go. We know that 70% of the world's homeless are women and girls. That in Afghanistan, 87% of the women suffer from domestic violence. We know why, because our boys are fighting. More than one third of all women worldwide will be physically or sexually assaulted in their lifetime. One, one third of us, according to the World Health Organization last year. All over the world, we know that rape is a common weapon of war. And women who are over, we are, we are in majority ladies, we are 51% of the world's population, Women who are over 50% of the world's population own 1% of the world's resources. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's totally imbalanced. Yeah. Uh, 
people, some have said that, you know, sin is about a lack of balance. <coughs> and if that be true, which I believe it is, that we're out of balance, then we are in sin. A hundred and sixty million <coughs> females have disappeared. Now, get that figure. A hundred and sixty million females have disappeared in Asia over the last 20 odd years due to a bias towards boys. In one Chinese city, there are 160 boys to 100 girls. How about this one? Picked up last week. India has set aside $33 million to erect the world's tallest statue of one of the male founders of modern India. This amount of $33 million for a statue of a male founder is $8 million more than the Indian budget for women's safety programs and $17 million more than the budget for girls' education. This is not so much about exploiting women, it's about completely ignoring them. 100,000 children, mostly girls, are sold in the USA every year, mostly in sexual slavery, into sexual slavery. It's huge, it, it's huge. It, uh, modern slavery is a hundred and fifty billion dollar industry, and it's the fastest growing industry in the world. It's beating the drug industry because it's harder to detect and control. hundred and fifty billion dollars. And this is just a little extra here. The United States, that's us, the United States trails 80th, 80th in the world ranking for the percentage of women in national government. Yes. Statistics clearly indicate that our country is run by elderly white males. Mm. Yes. Now, I have nothing against elderly white males, <laughs> but I do have a problem with imbalance, which is silly. Uh, just, you know, to remind us, as I said, that there is much to be done. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. So what are we going to do? What do we do? What are we doing? What must we do? Well, you know, I understand why people run for cover. I understand why when you listen to that kind of stuff or you put the news on or you read the newspapers, why you want to, it's a natural human instinct. We don't like the bad news. We don't want to hear uh, the bad news. Problem is we, we have to know, we have to know. There, there's a poem written by a favorite poet of mine, Souvenistic, called um, Hafiz, mm -hmm. that, that talks about this problem of, oh my gosh, this is awful, what are we gonna do? Oh, let's go out for dinner, or have a drink, or go to a movie, or, you know, let, let, let me play with my what whatever those things are, machines, you know, iPods and pads and things. You know, there is a resistance to the bad news. But as Christians, we're called to walk into the darkness because of the intensity of that little bit of light huh? uh, that we know we have within us. The darkness is not going to be dispelled by darkness, but only by a little bit of light. So our, our poet here writes about uh, this problem of resistance to the bad news. And the poem is called, And We Should Talk About This Problem. <laughs> there is a beautiful creature living in a hole you have dug. He's talking about our tendency when we hear of these awful things going on, uh, metaphorically, to dig a hole, dig a hole, get in it, cover ourselves up and say, tell me when it's all better. Tell me when it's all gone. So there is a beautiful creature living in a hole you have dug. So at night, 
I, God, set fruit and grains and little pots of milk and wine beside your soft earthen mound. And I often sing, but still, my dear, you do not come out. I have fallen in love, that is God, I have fallen in love with someone who hides inside of you. We should talk about this problem. Otherwise, I will never leave you alone. <laughs> it's like God bugs us. From the moment we dared, huh, as believers, to stand up and say, here I am, God said, gotcha, 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 gotcha. <laughs> and if in the process of the journey, um, we say, oh, you know, I, I can't take it anymore. This is too hard, you know. Because God will bug us forever. <laughs> Longing for us to respond in whatever little or big way we can. We don't have to be martyrs. We don't have to be, you know, saints and holy people. We have to be faithful people to that call, that little bit of light each one of us has. So, God is on our case. Huh? It can be scary, and it is scary, to reach out to new life, to new possibilities in the face of darkness. Reminds me of a story uh, of a, a woman in scripture that you've probably heard about. I heard about that woman who had a problem. <laughs> we have so many problems. <laughs> anyway, this woman, she had a problem. According to the writers of the scripture, she had this hemorrhage. Mm. Imagine that. I, I thought to myself when I was a younger woman, oh, she must have had this long nosebleed or something, you know? <laughs> so she got this hemorrhage. This poor woman had this hemorrhage huh? for, for, for 12 years, you know? And of course, the scripture writers were so nervous of the woman's body and all that stuff and sexual stuff. So instead of saying she was menstruating, they said, oh, she got this hemorrhage on. So there's this poor woman with a hemorrhage for 12 years. And in the time and culture of Jesus, a woman who was um, hemorrhaging, <laughs> menstruating, it was it's unclean. It's yucky, 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 yucky. Yeah? Uh, imagine that which manifests a woman's fertility, huh? considered unclean for thousands. Hundreds and hundreds of years. This is unclean. It, 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 it puts a woman down. And so a woman who was menstruating had to be separated from her community in case she passed on her so-called diminishment, a problem, which was menstruation. So you have to imagine this woman, in the time and culture of Jesus, isolated from her community, not just for a few days, but year after year, because she couldn't stop the flow. So here she was, isolated, cut off, Considered the lowest of the low. Here is a woman with no voice. Here is a woman who could not be any lower in society, in that culture. She had her own little spoon and her own little plate and her own little cup because no one was permitted to use the same utensils as a woman who was hemorrhaging. <laughs> what does that remind you of? AIDS. You know, oh my God, will we catch it? Will we get it? Maybe Ebola, whatever. Keep, keep away from those people. Keep away from women who are menstruating. So there she was in a little hut, year after year. Can you imagine what it must be like to be so rejected, to be so marginalized? Anyway, one day she heard this crowd outside her house. There's a whole bunch of people, and, and they were talking about this man whose name was Jesus who was going around saying the blind must see, and the deaf must hear, and the dumb must speak. And when that woman heard that kind of ridiculous comment, I think her heart went bum, bum, bum. She got so excited. Maybe, maybe if the dumb speak, and the blind see, and the deaf hear, maybe there's hope for me, who I'm nothing, who I'm the lowest of the law. Maybe, and just for a moment, she was hopeful. Just for a moment, I think she got excited about the possibilities of dignity, possibilities of new life. But then, you know, you get real, see? And you look around at the reality. Or you put it on the TV. Or you, you read the newspaper. And don't stop this stupid dreaming. Who do you think you are? I mean, really, just it lasts a moment, doesn't it? You get all excited. It's like ministry. You know, you start off, here I am, and all that. <laughs> And then, you know, but do you know something? It wouldn't go away. It wouldn't go.
go away. This thing, this, this little bit of news, this little bit of stirring she had deep within her gut. It had taken root so deep within her she couldn't shake it off, even though it was ridiculous. Even though it didn't make any sense, she couldn't shake it off. And do you know what that woman did? One day, well, she opened her closet and she took out her hat and she put it on and she said, I'm off. And that naughty little woman opened the door and out she came to where the crowds were around the one who was talking about the deaf and the dumb and the blind. And she knew she was taking her life in her hands because if she was recognized as the woman who was not permitted as the woman who was not allowed to be in public. She could be stoned for breaking the law, breaking the taboo. But so intense was her dreaming, so deep was her longing, and so deeply embedded in her was what she had heard, the news she had heard about the blind and the deaf and the dumb, that she kept on going. She took her life in her hands, and she knew that. But you see, the dream was deeper than, than fear like a woman who knows how to weave. She woke in and through and around the crowd, seeking the one who talked about the deaf and the blind and the dumb. She kept on going, huh? weaving herself forward as a woman knows how to weave and knows how to move forward by going backwards and around, <laughs> little by little moving forwards. And so would you believe it? And you know the story she found herself facing the one who talked about the blind and the deaf and the dumb. And there she encountered the disciples of Jesus, surrounding the Holy One, surrounding the sacred space, uh, keeping the laity back, keeping the women back from the sacred one. And do you know what that little woman did? I believe she slipped right through their legs, she did. <laughs> she was so longing to reach out for healing, for dignity, for new life, until she faced the one who was called Jesus. And she knew, as a woman, she didn't have to give a homily or a reflection, or whatever we Catholics call it. She knew, as a woman, the power of touch, according to the scriptures. She reached out and touched the hem of the garment made by his mother. And reached out from Jesus of Nazareth came the power into the little woman. And Jesus looked around and said, feeling the power leave him. Who did that? Who did that? Who touched me? And the disciples of Jesus, always the last to understand. <laughs> Check it out. Check it out. Everybody is touching you. Everybody is here. Everybody is around you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No, said Jesus, you don't understand. Someone in this crowd knows what's going on at a deeper level. Someone has touched me at a deeper level. Who is it? And that little woman knew that he was talking about her. And according to the scriptures, she raised her hand and told him her story. And Jesus looked on her, and he loved her. He loved her for her dreaming. He loved her for her longing. He loved her for her daring. And he loved her for her journeying. And to the woman who, according to the scriptures, had been bent double for 12 years, came the words of Jesus of Nazareth, woman, stand up, stand up. And for the first time, the woman stood up. Can you imagine what it must have been like for that woman after that? Well, do you think that she went back to her little hut <laughs> and took off her hat and put it in the closet? and said, oh, I had a lovely retreat experience today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you think she walked around her with her shoulders straight and a light in her eyes, encountering others who were afraid and broken and bent down, and that she said to them, I too was broken, I too was afraid, I too was intimidated, and now I stand up straight 
And don't you think that that light in her eyes was evangelization? Yes. And that we cannot, we cannot teach faith what happens, huh? is that it comes deep from within our belly, it comes from the fire within us. That faith is caught, not taught. It's caught by the energy of, of the presence of God within every single one of us. When we dare to believe enough in that energy, not to stir it, to allow it to gestate and break open. And then the broken hearted and the bruised and the afraid huh, will know that there is a possibility of new life. There is an invitation. And he thinks, we must, we must be like the woman with the hemorrhage. We must, we must reach out for the power and the strength and the grace that is in the healer who talks about the blind. We must not be blind and deaf and dumb. We are, in this generation, I believe we are creeping, uh, however tentatively, towards new possibilities. We are daring. That's why you're here, Don. <laughs> we are daring to confront the darkness with courage and hope. Little by little, we're becoming a little bit more conscious because we've heard the good news. We will no longer be blind and deaf and dumb. William Coffin, the social activist, wrote, <coughs> Hopelessness adapts. Mm. Mm. What can you do? Mm. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm 85 now, what can I do? Mm. You. Hopelessness adapts. Hope resists. Hope resists. We must resist. We are resisting. We are challenging. Exploitation. <coughs> Violence. Small-mindedness and prejudice. Oh, let me tell you about this woman I met in New York. Oh, we're in New York, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In, in New York City, I was giving a conference to, you know, the Maranon Missioners, the Catholic Mission Group? And it's a big missionary society, uh, Catholic Missionary Society. And they have an institute in New York, in Maranon, New York. And I was asked to give a conference to their uh, lay associates and lay missioners and some brothers, etc., and some of the sisters. So I went, and so, you know, you're in a big room like this, and... There was about 100, 200 people, something like that. And you, there's usually, almost always, somebody at the back of the hall messing about with coffee and water. You know how they are in conferences, you know, they pick up a glass of water and whatever. And here I am, I'm, I'm in a totally Catholic environment, all right? It, it's sort of like a town of its own, in Mary is. And this big building, this big institution. And there's this woman at the back of, as I am speaking, at the back of the room, and she's wearing a hijab, a Muslim veil. And I'm thinking, oh, this is very unusual in a totally Catholic environment, there's a woman wearing a hijab. So I said, in the break time, to one of the participants, I said, who's the, uh, who's the lady in the hijab? Oh, she says, uh, that's Sister Eileen. I said, who? That <laughs> <laughs> Sister Eileen. She a nun? Oh, yes, yes. I says, what's she doing wearing a hijab? Is it Muslim veil? She said, well, I don't know. Would you like to ask? <laughs> <laughs> she said, well, I'll, I'll ask her. So I went up to, to Eileen. I said, excuse me, sister. Why are, you, why are you wearing the hijab? Oh, she said, I thought, nobody would ever ask. <laughs> she said, well, it happened some years ago. She said, you know, when they blew down the towers in New York. And uh, I, I work with uh, I work with Muslim women, and my women were coming to me and they were crying afterwards and they were saying, "Sister, and people are spitting at us on the sidewalk and they're throwing stones at us on the sidewalk." And I said, "I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry about that. I felt so badly about that. And I thought, oh dear, what can I do? And I got this terrible inspiration. Mm. Do not trust." God. <laughs> like I said yesterday, God will take advantage of your... I do. <coughs> I head down. I got this terrible thought. Maybe I could be in solidarity with them. Maybe I could look yeah. like them. And, oh, no, no, it's, it's God you know, asking me to look like a Muslim in solidarity with their, with their pain, with their marginalization. And she said, I couldn't shake it off. Just like the woman with the hemorrhage. I couldn't shake it off. We are bugged by the divine. 
So she said, I went out and I bought a hijab. And I thought, I'm just going to wear this for two or three days. Just a, a, a quick witness. Uh, and I put it on, and people were making comments, and they were laughing at me, and they said, oh, you look really stupid, do you? Come on, take that thing off, you know? Yeah. And she said, I couldn't take it off because my women was coming to me and saying, sister, they're still spitting at us, and they're stoning us, and they're making comments and swearing at us. And she says, that was five years ago, and I'm still wearing it. You know, I felt like going down on my knees before this little nun. Because you see, I couldn't do that. I could no more walk into this room wearing a hijab. I couldn't do it. I, I, I wouldn't suit it. It wouldn't match. <laughs> and I said, thank God, whatever you've asked me to do, I'll do it, but not to wear a hijab. <laughs> None of us is called to do something different, to respond in whatever way. And there is Ivy, yes, wearing a hijab. And then she said to me, well, you know, it, it's got better. Uh, because now my, my friends and my family who initially said, oh, for heaven's sake, you don't have to go that far, you know. She says, now they've accepted it. And when it's my birthday or Christmas, they buy me different colored hijabs. <laughs> <laughs> and so I can match my outfit with the hijab. And I thought, look at that. Prophetic Christian witness with fashion. <laughs> on our journey. Eleanor Roosevelt <coughs> said, you must do the thing you think you cannot do. Yeah. You must stand and look fear in the face. Yeah. That kind of thing happens when we are so driven by the pain in our, and the compassion in our hearts, the pain at what we see, the compassion of wanting to make a difference in our world. We are driven huh, to action. We are compelled to respond. There's a Sufi saying, it is the crack in your heart which lets the mystery in. Mm -hmm. We have a crack in our hearts. We have a crack in our hearts. It can make us clam up so we don't get hurt anymore or we don't be challenged anymore and close up or it can open us up to healing and compassion. All over the world, I believe, a shift is happening. A new consciousness is arising about the exploitation of the planet, the exploitation of workers, the exploitation of women, bigotry, prejudice, all kinds of things. But the shift to transformation begins with ourselves. It really does. Uh, let me tell you a story to illustrate that. Uh, when I lived in Chicago and was running my program for women in recovery uh, from prostitution, one night there's a knock on my door, and I open the door, and there's this beautiful woman standing outside. She's got long hair, blue eyes, tall. She's a high-class call girl, one of the escort service girls. Really stunning, the kind of figure you'd expect to see on, yeah, I don't know, Vogue or some fancy magazine. And she's crying. And she says, I can't take it anymore. I just can't take it anymore. I, I, do, the, I do the big conventions. I do, I do the, you know, the, the corporate conventions and meetings. I, I do all the hotels. And, and, and my, my pimp is, is, it pushes me in. And, you know, I have to do these things, but I'm just so scared now. She's, she's a mess. She can't take it anymore. Oh, the exploitation, the prostitution, the massage stuff, you know, the, the, the escort business, you can't. And of course, that's the situation where you say, oh, here, come, come to us, huh? But they've come to us, huh? We haven't necessarily gone to them. She comes to me. I said, come in. You know, here we are to, to help you, to offer, you know, whatever we can. And I sat down, Anna taught me her story, the usual story, incest, rape, violence, all this kind of stuff. And I said, Anna, you can stay here and, you know, work for recovery. She was so excited. Uh, after a few days, I noticed that the other women in the program were kind of rumbling and mumbling and complaining and making comments. I said, are you okay? We don't like her. 
she ain't like us. We don't like her. I said, now, come on, ladies. You know, we're all in this together, you know. We're a family. No, we ain't. No, we, we don't like her. They rejected the high-class call girl, the escort girl, right? We don't like her. And I'm thinking, what can I do about this, sir? And I observed Anna. And after another few days, I, I, I called her. I said, Anna, you know, I need to talk with you. Anna? I said, Anna, you're a man, aren't you? <laughs> and she begins to wail. <laughs> I'm a man. I'm a man. I said, Anna, why did you tell me you were a man? <laughs> why did you tell me? And she looked at me in a way I'll never, ever forget, huh? with those tears rolling down her face. And she said to me, if you knew who I was, if you knew that I'm a faggot, I'm a queen, I'm a queer, you would never have taken me in, would you? You wouldn't have taken me in. I said, well, 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 well you see, Anna, I mean, we, we, we work with women. I mean, I mean, females, I mean, <laughs> you don't fit. You don't fit. You're a man. You don't fit. And Peter saw a great net fall down before him, which was filled with different varieties and colours, all these different fish, different shapes and sizes. And I believe the voice of God saying, they are mine. All of them are mine. I made them. I love them. They are mine. Yeah, but what about those who, they are mine, love them, all of them. Yeah, but some of them don't fit, all of them. Mm. Are all of them? Oh, we are too small for a big, big God. Mm. We are too small. We cannot even begin. Mm. This God who made all, I dare you, I dare you to love them all. <coughs> Anna, stay with us. We need you. We need you for our own conversion. We need you to keep us faithful. It is the ones on the edges. It's the ones on the outside. Huh? It is the ones who are battered, exploited, marginalized. They will be our teachers. They will be our teachers. I must say, I went to the other women. I said, ladies, uh, you need to know it's, it's okay. She's staying in our program. Oh, she is, is she? Well, you know now, don't you? You know she's a man, don't you? You know she's a man. I know she's a man. I know she's a man. But she's our sister. Well, that's okay, because see, we ain't got no problem with her being a man. That's not our problem. The, the problem was that she wasn't telling you the truth. That was the problem. You know, because you, you are a sister, you know, and, and, and she was lying to you. She was telling you, that you think she was a girl. So now it's okay. Okay, Anna, you want to borrow my mascara? It's okay now. Come on, baby. No. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's a story of conversion, but mine, you know, because we, we are all trained and taught and conditioned to have our boxes, to have our, you know. But you see, there are no boxes with God. And in our call to discipleship, the, the road is vast. We have to embrace all our brothers and all our sisters. In his 2013 Easter message, <coughs> Pope Francis declared uh, that, for instance, that human trafficking to be the most extensive form of slavery in this century. And said, let us not look the other way. There is great complicity, greater complicity than we think. The issue involves everyone. Exploitation of any kind involves everyone. If we are faithful, if we listen to our hearts and follow the deep instincts that we all have for love and for life, buried deep within us, that those scary instincts for love, buried deep within us, the Spirit of God will move us guide us in our call to face all forms of exploitation and to be involved in bringing about a world of justice. There's a, a lovely uh, 
quote in the Book of Wisdom about, about the Spirit of God, how, how the Spirit will come to us to the degree uh, that we are vulnerable and open to that call. Wisdom is bright and does not grow dim. That light does not fade. By those who love her, as we do, she is readily seen and found by those who look for her. Quick to anticipate <coughs> those who desire her, she makes herself known to them. Watch for her, not early, and you will find her sitting at your gate. Can you imagine when you get up in the morning? Oh, are <laughs> The spirit of waiting to meet us and to continue our journey with her. Even to think about her is understanding fully grown. Be on the alert for her, and anxiety will quickly leave you. She herself walks about looking for those who are worthy of her. And gracious shows herself to them as they go in every thought coming up to meet you. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. and, and those are the kind of things we have to remember on our journey that of course, of course we are we are not alone. That the Spirit of God uh, in this world of exploitation will come to meet us as we open ourselves to make a difference. And all over the world, millions of people whose hearts are open are part of this growing shift in consciousness of injustice and violence, particularly concerning, particularly concerning the exploitation of women. But in our generation now, more programs are being started to reach out and help women in recovery from prostitution and trafficking. When I started in Illinois, over 30 years ago, I was on my own. I know that. People thought I was mad. Oh, yes. oh God, you know. The, chief, the police sergeant, the police guy, uh, superintendent, said to me, honey, <laughs> you're wasting your time, okay? We know these women. We know these women. They, they thought I was, you know, that one is kind of, uh, you know. <laughs> and and there was no programs. I couldn't even find books to read, to study, no. about the issue of women, exploited women, prostitution and drugs. I, I couldn't find anything. <coughs> and, and it was a very lonely space to be. Now, if I compare 30 odd years ago to now, it's like, do you know that this very day, today, we have, for the first time, an international <coughs> directory of global modern slavery. We have it's come out today. Don't you think, is that a coincidence or is that providence? Huh? That as we gather here to talk about the exploitation of women, for the first time in history, we now have a directory available now, today, uh, on the organizations, national and international, dealing with women in slavery and children in slavery. I, I, that's incredible, incredible. So let me just see, where's my little note to say how many countries are involved in the, you will find in this directory of modern slavery uh, a comprehensive database of modern anti-slavery organizations with more than 120 countries represented. Over 770 organizations and hotlines working on human trafficking their locations, and their services. 205 of these organizations are in the United States. When I started, I couldn't find one other program 34 years ago that was working directly with women in <coughs> prostitution. Now we are saying, oh, 205, my goodness, of course we must be optimistic that the Spirit of God is coming up to meet us, that things are shifting, things are changing. And, and we must continue that, that journey with, with, with zeal. Uh, there are 568 internationally located organizations. Imagine that. It's exciting. And, um, 
And now that notices are being posted in airport restrooms. Have you seen them? <laughs> in airport restrooms aimed at trafficked women and giving telephone numbers to call for help. Colleges are offering workshops and conferences on this issue. You. And I have two more colleges I have to go to next year to talk about trafficking and exploitation of women. That's new. Huh? The criminal justice system no longer sees prostitution as a felony and throws the women in jail. The Johns, the tricks, now are being picked up. And we've started, or the, uh, my group of women were very um, active in starting, a, getting a new law passed in Springfield, Illinois, uh, which was the, uh, against the Johns. If, if, you are, if you are picked up, sir, uh, soliciting a prostitute and paying a prostitute, you will go to John's school. And what John's school is, is that every Monday night at 7 o'clock you turn up in Chicago in this room and you sit there with all the other tricks, all the other guys, all the other Johns, and the women in recovery from prostitution are going to talk to you and tell you what their lives have been like and what it's like to feel abused and exploited. And you have to attend this at least for a month, attending John's school. And if you get picked up again, you'll be given longer time to listen to women in recovery from prostitution. And if your wife says, where are you going, dear, every Monday night at 7 o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm just going out to meet Fred. <laughs> Don't you love it? Are you the women are getting the opportunity to say, see, honey, see what you did to me? You didn't know where I was coming from. But look at what happened. Uh, it, it's, it's a, a hot, it, instead of throwing the women in jail and saying to the guys, as they did when I was in a, a bar, um, <laughs> I was in a prostitute bar when we got busted. I mean, I wasn't doing anything except having a drink. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the police charged in. We're all sitting there. And they charge in, and they said, said to all the guys, Go on, get up, get up, go, go on, go on. So the guys get the heck out of there. And we women, we were all bundled into the paddy wagon. <laughs> Taken to, take to, to the, you know, the, 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 the jail. And I'm thinking, why are the guys going home to their wives? And we're in the paddy wagon. Exploitation. It's the woman's fault. It's the woman's fault. But now we're beginning to see these, this issue being addressed. Police, hotel staff, and airline flight attendants are now being trained, as you know, probably, and alerted to spot trafficked women and children. I got, I got this. What do you think of this? Da, 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 da. It's a flashlight. I got this from an air, uh, a flight attendant. They hand them out. And it's called the Blue Heart Campaign. Shine a light on human trafficking. You get a free flashlight. Nice. Mm. Now, isn't this something? There's a telephone number. If you recognize somebody in, in an airport or an airplane, a youngster or a woman who seems to be having problems and doesn't know where she's going and is nervous, you know, just check it out. Flash a light. So these kind of things, so these are being handed out um, in public places. More religious communities, you know, where, uh, religious women in the Catholic tradition for sure, who used to, you know, I mean, they all did it, they used to teach all the time, it was just teaching. Now they're doing all kinds of things, including opening homes for women in recovery from prostitution and trafficking. There are alternatives. We are here, both male and female, to be the midwives of new possibilities. We are to be the healers. That's our inheritance. That's the Christian calling. We are to be the healers and the birthers of new possibilities. There are alternatives. Let me tell you a story about um, one of the, the ministers I have now, I think I already mentioned, is, is offering retreats to women in recovery. All right, because you know we we middle class people, and we can go to the country, we can go to a retreat centre, we can go to a nice place and take a few days off, you know, with a, a, a nice environment and peaceful, holy surroundings to give us energy, to keep us going, right? And I'm thinking these women in recovery from prostitution, you know, they're in the inner city, they've got nowhere. I mean, they haven't got that kind of money, 
And so I started this program, which I call Sophia Circle, to get these women out of, you know, out of the inner city and take them to some nice place like a retreat center or a monastery or a convent. And you know, it, it's like, it, it's a healing you cannot do in any other way. Yeah, you know, these women, they come and they find themselves in some, this is a really nice place. And there's trees and, and there's gardens and, and there's all these kind of good, holy looking women. <laughs> you know? I, I remember that I took this group to the Erie Benedictine Monastery in, uh, in Erie uh, some years ago. And you know, the women come from Chicago and they, they all fall out of this van. And, and here they're coming into the monastery. You know, these are tough street women. You don't mess with these women. You know? <laughs> and they've got horrendous, horrendous backgrounds. So the monastery doors open. These are female nuns in there, right? Sister Joan Chitterson, you may have heard of. It's her gang. Yeah. So anyway, so the women come in. And the, the woman who's in front, she's a big African-American uh, ex-street woman, right? And then she comes, the women, the sisters are having, it's lunchtime. <laughs> and they're having lunch. And they've got this, you know, you've got the refectory refect door, you know, and you, you push the doors open. And in comes this woman uh, in front of all the other women. And she sees all the nuns, and they're all sitting having their lunch. And, you know, many of them are elderly, and they've been living together for about 40 years. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> And she pushes the doors on the cafeteria open and she says, Ladies, we're here! <laughs> this troop of recovering prostitutes comes into the, the dining room and the sisters are oh, so excited. That afternoon, I'm walking through the, the, the dining room and I see one of these nuns. She was she must have been 86, a little thing. You know, she still had a veil on, right? And she's surrounded by a bunch of these recovering street women prostitutes, you know? And I think, oh my God, what are they doing to me? <laughs> <laughs> and then I hear one of the women say, come on, sister, you're joking. Tell us the truth. <laughs> and then I heard the sister say, it's true. It's true. Sister, come on, you telling us you ain't never had sex. <laughs> Those women, they looked on this film like they were seeing a mirror. <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> so I've been having sex since I was four. How do you do that? How do you do that? And then the nun said, why, why don't we sit down? <laughs> why don't we sit down? And then it was incredible. It was a Amazing. Then followed this, this conversation about incest, rape, virginity, the religious life, celibacy, and violence to women. Mm. I know, I know that that sister had never ever sat down with five, six recovering prostitutes before and had a conversation, breaking down barriers. And I know that these women from the streets of Chicago had never ever seen a virgin before. <laughs> <laughs> it was so exciting, you know? <laughs> I mean, I can tell you so many stories. Well, all right, I, I, I shouldn't be telling you this story, but this is, this is, this are, these are all um, good news stories. Uh, that Sunday, that, you know, what we do in the Catholic tradition is we have what you call a Eucharistic procession. So you have Mass and the Eucharist, and at a certain point, you know, there's a, a group of people at the back of the church, and they're the ones who are asked to bring the bread and wine up to the altar to the priest, right? And this is how we do it. We bring up the bread and wine, mostly looking as if we're at some kind of funeral. <laughs> to the banquet of the Lord. <laughs> But anyway, I, I said to one of the sisters, sister uh, that was in charge of the liturgy, would it be possible for uh, a couple of our women to carry the gifts to the altar mm. on Sunday? Oh, she says, that's fine, and no problem. Yes, of course, that's right, rather nice. So I went up to two of the women, I said, hey, hey girls, 
How about this? Would you like to carry the bread and the wine, the gifts, you know, that the pre that, that we give the priest for, for the Eucharist up to the altar? You stand up. Oh no, no, I ain't doing that. No, no, I ain't got nothing to wear. No. I said, don't worry about what you're gonna wear. You know, I've got some nice skirts now, and you can wear one of my skirts. Said, oh well, well, I, I don't know about well, we'll have to practice. I said, okay. And then we went to the chapel, and there we spent the last next one hour, fifteen minutes practicing. <laughs> <laughs> Am I doing it right? Am I do you know, they were, they were so beautiful, mm -hmm. they, were, they were getting so excited. And the following morning, Sunday, before Sunday Mass, the women, there were 15 of these women, they were standing at the back of the church, and they said, oh, one, the ones who were carrying the bread and wine, I'm so scared, I'm so nervous. I didn't sleep all night, see, I didn't sleep all night, but I'm still sweating. I'm just, I said, no, it's going to be fine. So all you have to do is what we did, what we practiced doing for an hour and 15 minutes yesterday in the chapel. That's all you need to do. You stand up. I will give you a signal. When I give you a signal, all right, that's when you pick up the bread, you pick up the wine, and you start walking like a torture. All right, all right. And the other women in recovery, they go, yeah, okay, girl, give me five minutes. And it was like a, a soccer match. It <laughs> <laughs> was so exciting. Anyway, the mass began, the Eucharist began. And it came to the point where the priest, you know, what he, he, he did was he, he moved out from the altar and begins to walk down towards the steps in order to receive the bread and the wine, right? Well, the moment he turned and began to walk, the women who were supposed to be carrying the gifts, one said to the other, he's coming for us, we'll hit, quick, grab the wine, grab, and this, they're jumping. <laughs> they got it all wrong. And I, I taught them to walk with such dignity. <laughs> and they're running to the altar. And it's, and the Benedict is going, ooh, ooh, ooh. they've never seen anybody run into the altar of God before. <laughs> Usually it's like, as I said, there's constipated Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> so like it was some kind of humor. <laughs> and they loved it. You see, the women in prostitution, they exploited the downtrodden, huh? the tars, the hoes, running to the altar of God with their gifts. Amen. And I thought, oh God. <laughs> See my daughter, son. I cast all your sin to the bottom of the ocean. That night, we had an evaluation. You know, we Catholics always have evaluations. <laughs> and I sat round with the women. I said, okay, ladies, uh, you know, how has the retreat been? You know, any comments? Any feedback? And Vanna, the one who carried, ran with the bread. She says, yeah, she says, yeah. She says, see them nuns? I said, the sisters, yeah, them nuns. I said, yeah, uh, uh, the sisters, yes. Well, them nuns, <laughs> see, see, they don't know about us, do they? Right. I mean, they don't know like, uh, I mean, they don't know like what we're, I mean. I said, oh, you mean you think they don't know uh, what you've done and where you've been? Yeah, yeah. They don't know that, do they? Because if they knew that, well, they would never have let us do what we did this morning, like, take that bread and wine. They would never have let us do that if they knew about us. I said, but, but they do know who you are. They do know where you've been. They do know that you're recovering prostitutes. They know about us. They know about us. And they still let us carry that bread and stuff up to the altar. Every one of those women burst into tears. They could not believe that you would be worthy and invited to go to the altar of God, given your background, <coughs> given what you've been into. They just burst into tears. They couldn't they, they couldn't handle it. I'll never forget that. Anyway, I wasn't going to tell you that story. I was going to tell you the last story um, <laughs> about new possibilities. Well, that's new possibilities too. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the, one of the uh, every time I take a group of women on retreat, I try to get a different theme, you know, because some of these women, they won't go away. I've got graduates from 30 years ago and 20 years ago who just can't, they, they need that ongoing support in their recovery. They, they need that sisterhood uh, to know that's there for them. But every woman has to try and bring a new woman, so of course my numbers increase. 
But anyway, uh, uh, I have a colleague I work with in organizing these retreats for women in recovery. And I said to her, I said, okay, now what are we going to do for the next one? What, 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 have you got a theme? What, what can we do? We've done so many different themes. Oh, she says, I have a good idea. Why don't we do the Samoan Circle? I said, what? <laughs> the Samoan Circle. I said, what's the Samoan Circle? Oh, she says, it's wonderful. She says, this is what we do. You get two chairs up here in front, right? Two empty chairs, right? Uh, one for you, that you be the listener, and one for one of the women. And I stand at the back here on the stage, and I, we ask the women to go and to find a stone from the ground, bring a stone. And then I stand there and I invite, would anybody like to share their stone? This stone represents all that weighs you down. This stone represents um, all the, 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 the pain, the bruising of your life. Would anybody like to share their story? And then some people come up and sit there and, and, and talk about their story. I said, you're joking. I said, you know, I, I wouldn't do that. I bet in middle, if I asked you, ladies, come on, who's going to share your, <coughs> share your pain? I said, you know, we middle class women, like, no, we're not going to st stand up here and talk about what I've gone through and what I've suffered. She said, oh, we must, we must try it. So I'm, okay, let's try it. So did we send the women off, or uh, ladies, everybody go get yourself a stone, come back, explain that this stone that is what weighs you down. Huh? This stone is what has hurt you, violated you. And then the two chairs are put here, and I'm sitting in the one chair, I'm going to listen, okay? My colleague, like a great Buddha, is going to complain. <laughs> Would anyone like to come forth and share their stone? So anyway, as soon as she said that, Nikki jumps up and she plops herself down in the chair opposite me and she's got her stone and she's pushing it at me and she says, immediately crying, they're, they're, they're on the edges, this room, immediately crying, I want to know, I want to know why you raped me every Saturday from when I was four until I was 14, I want to know. And there's this tremendous silence in this room. The, the women in recovery, they know this stuff. It's like the end, right? And, and I am sitting there with this stone uh, in front of me, and the pain of this, this exploited, traumatized woman. Tell me why. Huh? I said, I don't know. I don't know why he raped you every Saturday from 4 to 14 years of age, Nikki. I don't know. But I do know that we are here, and that we are your sisters, and that we love you, and that we will continue walking with you and loving you. But what you must do, Nikki, is you must put that stone where it belongs. And there was the altar there. You, you give that stone to God. You put it on the altar. It belongs to God. God will heal. God is the great healer. Will you put your stone on the altar? And she all the tears come and she gets this is yeah, yeah. And she puts the stone on the altar. Everybody is silent. And of course my colleague says, Would anybody else like to shoot? <laughs> and major uh, Tanya leaps up, she plops herself in the seat in front of me, and she says, See last Wednesday. See when is this? I'm standing on that damn Ryan Expressway, that big, big freeway running right through Chicago. I'm standing on that damn Ryan Expressway, and I've been waiting for a big truck to come. She says, and I know them big trucks come on that damn Ryan Expressway because I live there. I live right by that damn Ryan Expressway, and I'm standing there, and I'm waiting for a big truck so that I can throw myself under them big wheels. And I'm waiting, and I'm waiting. I think no truck come. I don't know why no truck come. And then it began to rain. So I went home, and she says, now I know why God didn't send no truck, so I could be here with my sisters and give him a stone, give him a stone. But we were there for over two hours, <laughs> and God collected stones, stones, big pile of stones on the altar. Ah, we had to stop. Uh, it was, it was, it 
It was so emotional. It was, it was incredibly. <coughs> What's the word I'm looking for when you get it all out, you know? But anyway, uh, we stopped, and I said to uh, for lunch, I said to my colleague, I said, we, got, we have to find a storm. We have to find a storm. And we went out onto the grounds. We got this darn great boulder. And it was staggering in. And we put it under the altar. When the women reconvened that afternoon, um, I stood up, I said, ladies, I said, we have a storm too. And the two of us <laughs> lifted the storm boom, on the altar. I said, do you see this stone, ladies? Well, we will be carrying that. Huh? Myself and Carolyn will be carrying this stone until you let go of yours. <laughs> because you are our sisters and we share this stone. And then I invited the women, come back, take your stone, take your stone. Would you take your stone? And would you go outside? There was this big corridor, that, a veranda that looked out into the field. And I want you to throw that stone as far as you can. Well, the energy that leapt up. Right, yes. They, they got up, they grabbed, that's my stone, that's my stone. Oh, and now they're in view, and they're throwing the stones, and they're laughing. Hey, see how far I can throw mine? See how far mine went better than yours? And they're throwing the stones, and they came back. Without, it's, all, it's all symbolic and mm -hmm. metaphorical. They came back with no stones, and we had replaced the stones with lighted candles. <laughs> and I said, ladies, take a candle, because now this little bit of light is replacing the weight you have carried in yourself. This is God's light. And God will never be, but you must let go of your stone to be free. Scripture says only those who anguish will sing new songs. It is our consciousness of the exploitation of women, particularly, which will eventually bring about a change as society and church are impelled to action and to healing. And I'm going to end now, just a few minutes late, uh, before we take a break, with a reading um, about what that consciousness uh, can do. And this is from one of my books, Mothers, Sisters and Daughters. There's 5,000 for sale in the book set. And this is a story about one of my graduates, who is now one of my, uh, well, my kind of right hand. This is her story. The young teen stood with fake posture outside the rundown hotel, watching the traffic that slowed down to eye her. Up and down, inside and outside and beneath. Dressed in lime green hot pantsuit and patent leather boots, the child had no idea that this was just the beginning of a life of violence and brutality that would span her next 24 years. There was no fond memory of her childhood playing with dolls or toys, only of being played with by male adults, drunk and groping for sex with a four-year-old. He went on and on. It was normal for her. It simply happened all the time. It's what men did to little girls. At 14, she gave birth followed barely a year later by a second baby. Children, bearing children. It never occurred to her that this was not the way it was supposed to be. It was, after all, all she had ever known. She also came to know that she was beautiful. Men lusted after her. Even when she found a job as a sales girl, the boss offered her extra work after hours. Now she knew it did not have to be for free. 
and anxious to provide for her babies, she began a life of prostitution. Then followed years marked by a dizzying and endless parade of men in dozens of states, New York, California, Alaska, Ohio, Louisiana, Mississippi, and more. Her clients were businessmen, politicians, entertainers, boxers, drug dealers, celebrities, pimps, gangsters, thieves, and dignitaries. They called her Breezy for the skill and speed with which she moved from man to man. Now she had no time to think in the whirlwind of excitement, glitter, and violence. But occasionally she had the time to feel the sting of the slaps, the pain of the bruises, and the cuts from the knives. But the mindless journey continued as she moved from street to street, brothel to club, hotel to motel, and state to state, dressed in furs and satin, with shining eyes and flashing smile, belying inner horror, devastation, and ever-deepening despair. Drugs destroyed consciousness, providing blissful but temporary stupor, alleviating any awareness of reality. Even the beatings by her pimp were muted by the power of crack cocaine. Baby number three was born, jaundiced and shuddering with drugs. The tiny infant was taken to a safer place and to be reared by a new responsible mother. Taking refuge in a nearby women's shelter, Breezy huddled in the broom closet, her own personal tomb, for three long days and nights, forgotten by the stressed-out shelter staff. Broken and sobbing in the broom closet, no longer numbed by drugs, she prayed to God and to the baby for forgiveness. It was the breakthrough from despair to defeat <coughs> to surrender. Now all emptied out, Breezy found her way home to Chicago, longing to be filled by the love of her children so long abandoned. It was the beginning of healing, of miracles, of hope. She took the hand offered to turn around. She embarked on her journey out of hell. She staggered from drunken stupor into sobriety and began to see. Again, she embraced the steep steps of the recovery process and began to live again. She rose from dark dying into a bright light. And in that light, Breezy died. And Brenda was born again. And all who met her would know it. And all those who were trafficked, abused, prostituted, and beaten would come to know that Brenda was there to tell them in clear, ringing, and powerful voice that there is life, there is hope down there in that darkness. Rising like a phoenix, she stood now, beautiful and radiant, with outstretched arms. Come, sister. Come, sister, take my hand. And standing on her shoulders, they do. Mm -hmm. What do we do now? <laughs> Yes. Just so you know, um, you're, you're flexible until noon. 
I just want you to know they don't have to go anywhere from you, but I also want to say they'll need the bridge. Go to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, we could, we could, can we, we could take any questions, and if people need to go out and stretch or go to the bathroom, you can do that or whatever. All right, yes. Was there ever any retaliation from the fence since you were taking away the system? Yeah. Uh, you, you do get that. Um, <clears throat> I would get abusive phone calls in the middle of the night, calling me a few things I won't mention here. Uh, and then my car windows were shattered and stuff. You know, you, you get you get that. But it's not major. It's not. I mean, I was never hurt. I was roughed up by the Chicago police, though. Used <laughs> to thought I was a prostitute. <laughs> But, uh, I mean, that's always there. The women are terrified of these men. You know, some of them are, are, are killers. You know, they will, they will harm these ladies who, who find it very difficult to separate. To separate a, a woman from her pimp, <clears throat> it's like, it's the hardest thing to do. It's, it's, it's the hardest thing to do. Because this is, this is the man who's loved them. As they say, I think I mentioned last night, you know, he beats the shit out of me, but he loves me. And I just need to do better. I need to make more money. You know, I need, uh, you know, this, this absolutely uh, convoluted sense of loyalty. Yeah. So when you take the pimp away, the woman <laughs> has to struggle with having lost her. She has no identity except with her man. A man is the, all, her only identity. This is my, my man. You know, this, this is my guy. This is... So uh, that, that's the hardest process. We used to have to send women out of state, some of them, rather than risk them being picked up. And we grounded women for three months when they first came to the house. We, we couldn't let them go because there's that, that codependence, you know, nip out to the phone and say, it's okay, honey, I'm fine. And then just beginning to find out where you are. Yes. There's this thing called us and them that we all like to do. Um, Can you all hear? No. Mm -hmm. no. <coughs> there, there's this thing in the world called us and them. Us and them. That we all like to do where they're over there and we're over here. Yeah. And <coughs> for most of the people sitting in this room, I can imagine that you are describing the world of them. Well, <coughs> can you make a connection with how these women in prostitution could be in our lives? Well, physically, that, that's probably almost impossible, except if one goes to any programs, existing programs, for either battered women, sheltered women, or one looks out on the street corners and tries to do a breakthrough with a comment. Are you okay, honey? You know, begin to develop a pen. But, but you have to be really alert, be on the alert for her. The Book of Wisdom talks about the spirit. I would say talk about the prostitute. Be on the alert for her, those whose hearts are, hearts are open. That we just have to be conscious that these women are everywhere. They're, in, they're here in Rochester. Yeah. They're in oh, the yeah. shelters, they're on the streets, they they're in the bars here in Rochester. Yes. Not everybody is called, nor must you. Uh, go out looking for women in prostitution. It, I do believe it's a special calling. It's, it's, we all have a special calling, a different calling. And you, you have to really know, this is, this, this is my calling. But we can affiliate, can connect with programs in existence, including my Sophia Circle. Occasionally I have a guest on my retreats. I let the women, look. I ask the women's permission for that. Say, can, can we bring an outsider? <laughs> then we're outside then. And, into our gathering, and that's a very a, 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 an effort to try and get women like us, middle class women, into a group of women in recovery as observers, as listeners, as sisters, so that they can understand more deeply and connect with the women. And actually, I have to tell you this: uh, my last my last retreat, I invited you know the, uh, what's the name. Uh, 
uh, dead man walking. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Helen Jean. Uh, Helen Jean, <laughs> wrote the book Dead Man Walking. And uh, I know her, and uh, I told her I was giving this, this retreat to women. Oh, I want to come, I want to come. You know, she's into, you know, uh, the death, uh, death penalty. And I've seen many men uh, executed. But uh, she came on, on my retreat. And, you know, I explained to the women, you know, this, this is a lady, she's a nun, all right, but she's okay, okay? She's all right. And she works with, with death row prisoners, yeah. So, well, women were fascinated. She got to, she's always cracking jokes, Helen Fajit. She's so funny. The women loved her. Well, at the end of the retreat, before Helen Fajit returned to New Orleans, which is where she, she lives, um, the women, two or three of the women stood up and said, Sister Helen, Sister Helen, we want you to stand up. Uh, because we so much appreciate your being here, and you, you've been real cool, and we really like you. Uh, so we have, we're giving you an award. Well, Helen, she, you know, she's standing there. You know. And we are, we would like to invite you to be an honorary hope. <laughs> <laughs> Down barriers, so you read more about us, you know, get to, get to know what's in the local shelter, the local women's program, and look at this directory. Get this directory, and we'll show you over, to, uh, over you know, 200 organizations in the United States. Wow. Yes, yes. We're the local shelter, Alternative Battered Women's. If ah. anybody's interested, Pam and I'm Jamie. So. Where's Pam? There's one of our panelists to say. Oh, right, 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 right. Right, yes, sir. So we seduced you in, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> we were good at that. Yeah, we can do that. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, yes. I just wondered if you see any difference between the treatment of women in uh, countries where prostitution is legalized. No. Does that <clears throat> change anything? No, it, uh, it looks like it, ostensibly, externally. Especially, you know, the the escort women or the uh, the brothels in, in Las Vegas, it's like Nevada, you know. Hey, these ladies will say, you know, this is my life. See, I, I'm fine, I'm fine. I, I, when you get behind that, I, mm -hmm. I, I, every time I get behind that with women who say, you know, it's my choice. You know, I make good money, honey. I make good money. But there's always, so they are the ones who, who, I think, repress the deepest pain and time and time again, I have worked with you know women like that who start out by saying, you know, you leave us alone, huh? We're fine. And then comes the breakthrough and the breakdown and the tears and the stories. You have to get the stories. It's a cover. I think it's a cover. And even the women in prostitution tell me, they say, you know, they're just they're just manipulating. They're, they're just they're, they're fooling themselves. They're fooling themselves. The best teacher. Is a woman in recovery, mm -hmm. you know. When when I you know have women's in groups, you know, it's not me saying now, you know, it, it's the women themselves. Say, hey, don't 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 tell us that crap, you know. And then they break down. We know you've got something inside you. <coughs> really, you didn't. No nine-year-old huh, says to you when you ask, "What would you like to be when you grow up, honey?" Mm -hmm. Oh, I'd like to be a prostitute, <laughs> call girl. They don't. They don't. But they have to cover up in order to survive. And we think, this is cool, they like it. You know, it's called freedom, freedom. Uh, you know, your own rights, human rights, you know? You choose what you want to do. So we make it legal, which is like saying, it's legal to be a battered woman. You know, it's legal. To, we used to, uh, alcoholism used to be illegal, criminal activity, you know, or drunks were thrown in jail. And then we said, you know, this is a social problem. We've got a social problem here. This shouldn't be, we shouldn't throw you in jail because you're, you're drunk. You know, we should say, you, you need help, you need treatment. We haven't done that with prostitution. 
We've said, no, it's their choice. You want to be drunk? Okay, go get yourself drunk. Would you uh, share your story after the ride in the paddy wagon? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we were taken to jail. And, uh, and I hated doing this because it separated me from the women. But I had to be interviewed, you know, okay, who are you? And I had to tell them that I was. Well, I said I was a social worker. Uh, life through your teeth. But, you know, I said, you know, I, I work with these women because when it came to it, and, and I had to see the women uh, put in the cage, and, and I could go home. I, I, it was, it was a, a, a real sense of betrayal, in a way, for myself. But I couldn't lie to the police and say, you know, I'm, I'm Mary Blow, and you know, and I, I work these streets, and, and take my fingerprints. I had to say, you know, I'm, I'm with these women, and I'm, I'm, I'm their minister. So, okay, go. And then I went back for my women the next day. Yeah, see if I could get them out. Mm. I should get some different. Well, I should get from that. Yes. I, I think I can speak loud enough. Um, my question almost is just like the, the gentleman just now uh, being arrested. My thing is, you witness the police come in and say, okay, guys, scram, get yeah. out of here. Yeah. Okay, yeah. when, when you weren't put in that cage with the women, and when they interviewed you, did you report how the police did? Because to me, that's double standard, and that should be, something should have been told to the lieutenant, or to somebody, or to the mayor. Yeah. What, sure. you know, the police, we thank God for them, but they do some underhanded things and, sometimes. And that was, the, <coughs> that was an okay thing to do then. It was about 20 odd years ago. Of course, I mean, this is the way it works, you know. You guys go home, you come, you go in prison. They were, they were absolutely doing exactly what, what their job was, which is picking up women who were seducing men and booking them and putting them in jail overnight. I mean, what could I say? Stop picking up the women? <coughs> and that's my whole ministry was trying to do that. But this is the system. It's the criminal system. And that's how it was 20 years ago. Yeah, but this is how it was 10 years ago. <laughs> it's only in the last 10 years that there has been a shift. Yeah. Yes. Um, I know this is about women, but I wanted to say, and I'm retired now so I can say this, but I work in a lot of schools. And what I found very interesting is I would get young boys in yeah. who were extremely promiscuous acting out, and I saw an increase in sex addiction. And I would work with these young boys and women and say, you know, honey, you're precious. You know, don't misuse your body. You know, sex is not um, a recreational activity. It's a spiritual connection it's in, a, in a committed relationship. And they would tell me that their fathers would tell them to get a big box of condoms and get it out of them, their system. That's right. And I had young kids. I was afraid of being fired. I'm retired now, so I can say this. Because you, in elementary and middle school, you're not supposed to say sex, and you're not supposed to go in this direction. Um, and I would have fathers call me up curious that I was making their boys a P word. And, and, and for me, um, it, you know, boys, are, this is about women, but it's, it's just as important for me as young men know that, you know, you're precious too, and this is not the direction. When I would reach some of the boys, they'd say, do you have a mother? Do you have a sister? Yeah, would you like someone doing that to them? And I could reach them on a, on a level like that, and I found there isn't that much of a difference. I love what you said yesterday about the, the dead bones. And, and somehow, the Johns and everybody, it's such a detachment from your soul to go in this direction. Um, and, and this is a wonderful workshop. And I, you know, I, I hope we can reach even younger people so that these kids yes. aren't groomed to go in this direction. I mean, prison is full of a lot of young men that's been abused as well. So I know this is about women, but if we can reach kids younger and not make this a taboo, it's such a, you know, it's needed. Need. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed your. your uh, yeah, occasionally I talk to a high school, but it's not my forte. <laughs> I, I really, you know, I enjoy the women's groups. Yeah. But you know, I, I think it's important to talk to uh, school children, to younger people. And just, and just another note about, about um, are there prostitutes among us? I know many, and their teachers and their ministers and their all walks of life, and recovery is a wonderful thing. I've come in contact with a lot of people. Your work is excellent, thank you. Well, we're all in recovery from, yeah. you know, some, yeah, being Catholic and whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Recovering Christians. <laughs> yes. We're talking about such a tragic situation.
situation. And you mentioned in your story, one of your stories, and I'm sure there are many, many stories about the, about the kids that come out of this, the multiple babies that are born out of these kinds of situations. What's the story for them? What, what is done to help the children of these women? And that added heart break that they lose their children yes. as well as second from yes. 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 Yeah. It's like women who are addicted and have an addiction. They lose their children, you know, and you know, women who are picked up prostitution, put in jail, they, they do lose their children, you know, if they, they're not able to take care of them. So most of my women have had their children either taken by social services or else their grandma or their aunt or their older sister. The, the children are farmed out, you know, and that's the way it is right now. You know. Unless the woman, we, we have had a number of women obviously in full recovery who then we help to process the reclaiming their children. And that's always exciting, but it's not majority. It's just a social tragedy, yes? Did you know, I was thinking about Katrina's statements about the Aston Vim, and I have been often listening to you. I know so many women in marriages mm -hmm. who stay because they and their children are maintained. And basically, the, mm -hmm. the agreement is you be available sexually whenever we need. That's right. And and on the outside, everything looks great, but inside, when you speak to these women, they feel like horse. Yeah. There's no difference. And so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of wondering if you're coming from that, because we do, we tend to think of prostitutes as those who are, you know, outside of sometimes the context of marriage, who it's an economic <coughs> agreement. But, but how much of that is actually in our societal mix and almost has been set up by patriarchy and often, you know, heterosexuality. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't know if you can just speak about that, but maybe that us and them dichotomy and divide is actually yes. such a false illusion. Yeah. That, that's a good point because, you know, I, I, I've met, you know, a couple of women even here, mm -hmm. and I've only been here since yesterday afternoon, <laughs> who shared with me, you know, their story of being battered women in a marriage context. Mm -hmm and how long it has taken for them to move out of that battered women's concept. Because we are trained, obviously, and brought up um, to accept the cross, and uh, to accept our suffering, you know, and that's endemic in our society. And the, our connection with our children, the fear of losing our children, if we leave our man, if we leave the husband, uh, is all part of it. It, it. Sometimes it's easier for a woman, especially if her self-esteem is already you know, very, you know, being built up. She's no self-esteem, zero self-esteem. To, to, to face all that trauma of trying to leave her husband and the danger of losing her children and all that. Sometimes it's easier to be a battered woman than a free woman. <laughs> and that's the reality. We have to stop stereotyping what it means to be a man, a stud, you know, strong, powerful, chin up, you never cry, never hurt, never show any feelings or whatever. Uh, and a real man, a real man with feelings, tenderness, emotions. And a woman, you know, not just a sex symbol and a weak and firm and second class, but strong and independent. We really are out of balance. We really are so out of balance. And, and that's it. So we, uh, the mothers, especially young mothers, have to begin to treat their children with equal dignity. You know, and, and help them to understand that they're, although we are different male and female, we are equal, with, with equal gifts. We, we're, we're still, well, we're a long way from that, but, yes. You've, start, you've said so many things about <coughs> the children and, um, and how often this begins at, in childhood. Yeah, yeah. What, what do we need to be looking for with the children? How, how will we, how will we know? Well, the kids are all scared, you know, they're all terrified. Kids don't talk, you know, especially if they're told, you know, you say anything, you're gonna, you know, you're dead, or, you know, I'll beat you up, or... The children are so, so easily intimidated. But it does affect their behavior, you know, so, I mean, teachers in schools should be trained just as flight attendants are trained, you know, uh, to recognize there's, there's a passenger here I'm worried about that 14-year-old passenger, you know? 
uh, school teachers should be trained to recognize children who are withdrawn, who are looking distressed, who are nervous, and who don't fit in. Yeah? And yeah? it's consciousness. Um, we'll just take maybe one more. Well, what do you think? Should we let, let's, let's take these last two, and then we do need a break. Right? Yes. Yeah, I think the DV advocate for 24 years. What advocate? Domestic violence. Oh, domestic violence advocate. 24 years. And, and <coughs> Dana, you spoke to my, um, my agency years ago. I did? Oh. Yeah, in Pennsylvania. And I was young. born and bred in the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And uh, you were recommended and you did a thing for a whole bunch of domestic violence advocates. And, oh, and we're uh, in <coughs> Pennsylvania uh, with Barbara Hart, who's an uh, 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 attorney who was great, who's part of the stuff. And, um, we all heard about you. So we go and see you. And I remember that it was Pennsylvania says survivor centered trauma informed. So we've been talking about that stuff for a very long time for the domestic violence victims movement, right? So as we just shows up and starts talking about prostitutes. And we were like, okay, well we should go find out about prostitutes because we're probably are serving people who are prostitutes. And everything you talked about was so back to the baseline of the movement on how we need And you did this great thing about walking the journey. Do you, uh, do you still do that? You talked about walking up to somebody, what do you need? Oh, here we go, I'm gonna walk with you. And you actually demonstrated, you might not even remember this, I think it was 20 years ago. And then you <laughs> in front of everybody and said, so this is what we need to do. Oh, come along then. Okay, you're going that way? Okay, I'm here. And then she stood there. And then she goes, I'm over here, I'm still here for you. And then she goes, oh, you want me to come and talk to you? Okay. And then she walk again. You did this huge demonstration about just meet people where they're at walking the journey. And when she did that, there was no them and us. Yeah. Because we're yeah. just there. You're yeah. just walking. Okay, you're going to go back out there. Okay, but we're here. So when you come back, we're here. And that's always <laughs> just really molded, molded me in how I serve and meet people who are surviving this crime or who even are at and um, you, you've been absolutely amazing. Uh, uh, plus, you swore. And I no. <laughs> 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 you know, you're not going to be too long. <laughs> <laughs> but you probably don't, don't remember that. But I, I heard remnants of you. But you Thank really you. do walk the journey, the journey with, with us. That just reminded me of a very brief little story. Yeah, tell it. Very brief. And this was. You know, I'm with the women in the house, and actually at that time uh, we were real short of cash. You know, it was, it was, uh, we, you know, we didn't have money and stuff, or very little. And there was one time um, I was sitting around, and I, I said, "Ladies, uh, you know, we do have a we do have a problem here. You know, we we, we need to get some income." And <laughs> one of the women. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, uh, no. Uh, Come on, we can do this. This is for a good cause. <laughs> I said, I'm in charge here. And it's my responsibility. So I'm leaving now. And I'll be back by the morning. <laughs> well, I'm doing it. No, I said, don't, it'll be all right. Don't worry. I love you. And, you know, we have to keep going on doing what we're doing. So you don't leave this house. You stay here, all right? And I'll see you later. And off I go. And actually, I got a booking for a talk in a church that night. But the women thought... <laughs> So I had cash. 
<laughs> well, the women they're watching the movie are coming and they're going, You okay? You okay? You okay? I said, so I'm fine. Come, I want you to show I want to show you something. And on the table I emptied all this money. Well, it was about I it was only about three hundred dollars, but you know, I emptied and the women. Oh, we love you, we love you. <laughs> talking to church. Oh, they were furious. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the system. <laughs> anyway, okay, just like to tell you that. <laughs> walking with them, uh, walking out, doing the thing, you know, that's what they thought, you know. I'll sell myself for you. We can, So. Sorry, Have you worked with women that have caught up in the form of your adult entertainment industry that tried to get out? Yeah. Well, you know, they've, they've all been involved in some degree in porn because if, if you have a pimp, one of the ways he will try to turn you on is with uh, your complete, you know, constant showing of pornography and, you know, because you've got to go out there and, and earn $500 tonight. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's the drugs, and the porn, and the beatings. You go out and get that, because I love you. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's part of the whole prostitution business. My question, if you don't mind, is somewhat similar to his. Um, but there's another type of exploitation of women, and that is in media, including oh. videos where women skin their gyrations, and most of the time they hardly have on any clothes at all yeah. in the movies. Uh, and parallel to that, men usually, you barely ever see that type of nudity with men. Um, even women singers like Beyonce, she's yeah. almost naked on the stage yeah. most yeah. of the time. So how would you compare that to the promotion of prostitution? Or I'm absolutely part of it. It's all part of it. It's all part of it. You know, you get a woman draped over a car. You know, the guys are looking at the woman as much as they're looking at the car. I mean, we, we sell things, we, we sell goods, we sell, you know, we, we, tra we trade. A woman's body is, is, is always being used in, in, in the media. You know, for uh, even the Wheel of Fortune, you know, you get them there doing their thing. I mean, you know, it's like, it's endemic, it's everywhere. The, the, the parading of the female body. And it's covered up as fashion or sales you know, or beauty, or whatever, but it's got to change, it's got to change, but it will only change one by one with us, with our understanding, our consciousness, uh, consciousness raising, and whatever we can do in our little circles, including this one. But now I think I should stop, we've been here a long time. Thank you. I'm Gail Ricciuti. I'm a member of the Women and Gender Advisory Committee, and I've been given the lovely task of thanking you this morning. So on behalf of this whole crowd of witnesses, I have two things to say. First of all, on our behalf, <laughs> and secondly, um, I've heard these words attributed both to a mystic and to a rabbi. But they, one or both of them said, if the only prayer you ever pray is thanks, that will suffice. Yes. And I've been thinking that the God who all morning here has been saying, gotcha, 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 has, is hearing our prayers of thanks for you. And so we honor what you've said, and we are delighted by your presence. And look forward to this afternoon when after lunch there will be a panel in conversation with Edwina here, back here in this room at 1.15. And meantime, at noon, upstairs in the refectory, um, those who have made their reservation are invited to share lunch together, and then we'll see you all back here at 1.15. So thank you for being here. So thank you all.